Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, I've come to Adcox Nursery in Fuquay, North Carolina. This is a nursery that actually does uh, some retail, um, it allows for some retail customers on Saturdays, right? And then, um, but is a big yard for a very fast growing suburban area of Raleigh and landscapers are here all day long uh, grabbing things for their jobs. This is a nursery that I have a lot of experience with because I used to buy a lot of things as a landscape contractor, and then when I had my nursery, I got my money back um, <laughs> by bringing things here and selling things to Jeff. A great friend of mine here, Sean Gherkin, who I've known for a long, long time in this business, is it works here at Adcox and uh, has agreed to be part of my uh, Plant Master series. He's going to downplay himself, but I will tell you he's a walking encyclopedia. Uh, in the in the nursery business as an asset to all the nurserymen in our area here in North Carolina. Sean, you want to talk about your history in, uh, well, in the I horticulture will, trade? I will, Jim. I'm, I've been in the uh, horticultural industry since, uh, gosh, about 84. I went to NC State, uh, mm -hmm. two degrees, one in horticulture, one in plant, master's in plant pathology. Mm -hmm. And uh, But back then, I was a fruit and vegetable guy, so don't hold that against me. Uh, uh, <laughs> Worked in the sweet potato industry for a while and uh, mm -hmm. then transitioned into nursery production. I've worked at four large wholesale production nurseries, including the last nine years here at Adcox. Right. And I've enjoyed it immensely. All those other guys are still friends of mine. I buy from them. They buy from us. It's, a, it's kind of a unique industry that uh, how we all, even though we move around and work at different places, we all yeah. maintain healthy friendships and healthy business relationships. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I talked to, I mean, it was it always amazing to me, somebody you can be competing with, you can also pick up the phone and call Absolutely. and say, hey, what are you doing tonight for this 10 degrees? You know, and that guy will we tell you. We do it every day, yeah. every day. It's, it's amazing. So again, uh, we're gonna go around uh, Adcox here this morning and talk about some of Sean's kind of go-to uh, landscape plants and why. And uh, so let's get started. We've pulled out a 15 gallon Edgeworthy, which this might be the only nursery in America growing 15 gallon uh, Edgeworthy. So tell me about it. Well, as you'll see, I think we're gonna talk about a few other plants later, but I'm, I'm a low key kind of guy. I like green background plants. And then you can highlight a few things in front of them if you want, but this is one of the highlight plants. This is a, a show off plant. It's Edgeworthy Chrysantha. Uh, I have one in my landscape that uh, actually won as a door prize at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum about 19 years ago, I think it was. Wow. It's doing fine. It's now about, it's suckered and grown grown wider, of course. Uh -huh. But it's about four and a half, five feet tall and about eight and a half feet wide now. Right. It's and some out. of that's from multiple suckering gotcha. from the original plant. The cuttings in this house, and we do our own cuttings here uh, on this plant, predominantly came from my home landscape from that original J.C. Ralston plant. Right, got gotcha. you, got gotcha. you. This plant, what I like about it, and it'll lose its leaves as soon as it gets a little colder. These are in a protected structure right now, but these flowers will expand and in as early as late January, February, and even mm -hmm. into March and April, you'll still see some blooms depending on the weather. It's just a big, golden, very fragrant, pendulous flower. The plant has no leaves at that point, and it's covered with these. You can see how many flower buds are on here. They're very fragrant. It's in the Daphne family. So the fragrance is much like any of the, the evergreen Daphnes right. that are grown in, in the United States. What I really like too, in the winter, the plant, these leaf scars with the contrasting color to the brown stem are predominate. And it's just a show off kind of plant, very fragrant. Not too many people have it, so you can get a little bragging rights if you got one. <laughs> right. And in my experience, it's not been hard to culture. I've not, I've not had root rot issues in, the, in my landscape. Occasionally right. we may see a problem. I've heard of if it's in too wet a site, but anyway, I've, I've found it right. very easy to culture it, my home landscape. Right, and one of, the, one of the things I love about this plant is, again, you talked about it being a four season plant, but these flower buds are on here for months. Oh, absolutely. They're yeah, ornamental so, in themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they're ornamental in themselves and it builds anticipation. I like plants like camellias that build, absolutely. build anticipation. Okay, so let's move on. Next up on Sean's list is one of my all-time favorites is a uh, Viburnum tinus. So what makes this plant special to you? Well, this one is a, a cultivar called Compactum. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the trade 30 some years and this is the best one I've seen. Mm -hmm. that, well, I've grown, I haven't seen them all, I guess. But I, mm -hmm. spring, I think Spring Bouquet grows a little bit too rank compared to this one. 
This plant stays tight inner nodes, very well behaved. You can use it mm -hmm. as a specimen or as a, a small hedge, but it's green, it's tough, uh, six to eight feet. I've never even seen but one eight feet, but they're easy to keep four to six, and they bloom again in the wintertime when, when you're looking for some interest. Not right. particularly fragrant or anything, it's just a surprise to walk out and you see these pink flower buds have opened into a faint pink and into white in February, March, when nothing else is going on in the landscape on, on woody plants much, right. other than Edgeworthy. Right, and this is another, it's got a four, this is another four season interest plant because we have the flower buds on them through the winter. Uh, you got the red stems, uh, the new growth is a lighter color than the old growth. Yeah, it's, it's always been one of my. From a production standpoint, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a rocket, it's not quick to grow. That's right. another reason we, we grow it. Not many people grow this plant in seven gallon size. It takes a little effort. Uh, sometimes it's worth it to, to have a good plant to take a little longer time. Right, gotcha. Another one of our favorite plants here at Adcock's Nursery is one of our signature plants is Shindo Viburnum. This is an evergreen Viburnum. It actually was brought to this country from Shindo Island in Korea by Dr. the late Dr. J.C. Ralston, who was director of the uh, the J.C. Ralston, now named the J.C. Ralston uh, Arboretum, is associated with NC State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. We just like it. It's a good workhorse. It's a, you can use it as a specimen, let it grow up to 17, 18 feet tall, 6, 8 feet wide as a specimen. You can use it as a screen. It's just very lustrous, shiny green leaves. It does bloom and does make some red fruit, but that's pretty much insignificant. The main thing is just the structure and the shininess. Big leaf evergreen. A little bit coarse texture. It contrasts well with other finer textured evergreens that you might use. Uh, Jim, this is an example of some Shindo viburnum that were planted in late 80s or early 1990s. Uh, unfertilized, haven't been pruned, haven't been sheared. Uh, they're not irrigated. Uh, they, they were drip irrigated when they were first installed, uh, was that 30 years ago? But uh, uh, 20 some years ago, but uh, this is kind of an easy grow plant. So this is an interesting house, Sean, because you've got cephalotaxis three ways. Well, that's what we'll call this house. Yeah. Uh, t tell me about them. Well, I really, this is another one of those green background plants that I, yeah. boring horticulturists like me like. Uh, it's cephalotaxis, Japanese plum yew. Uh, mm -hmm. We have it, I think there's actually four in this house. We've okay. got the upright, which some of, if you've been to any older homes in in the south anyway, uh, you'll see examples of that. That's the first one I ever saw right. in my horticultural career. You'll see them sometimes eight or 10 feet tall and anywhere from four to six feet wide in older homes. And then as I got into my horticultural career, I started seeing these other cephalotaxis. Uh, the University of Georgia campus, I saw my first prostrata in right. landscape beds. Down there doing some tours back in, uh, gosh, in the late 19th, 1990s and early two, 2000s, and I, I got intrigued with the plant, and I said, I really like it, I want to grow more of it. So we grow Prostrata, which is one cultivar, and then here's one called Duke, Duke Gardens, right. which was uh, named after uh, a sport off of Fastigiata that was growing at Duke Gardens in, in the Duke University campus in Durham, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So, and we really like that. It's dark green, slightly different than that. That one's more spreading. And even there's a fourth one way over there. I don't know if you can see it from the camera. It's called Drupaceae. Drupaceae is almost uh, like a combination of the Duke Garden and Prostata. It's, it's a little right. bit more upright and vase-shaped, but not upright like Fastigiata. These are just good background plants that live a long time, don't require a lot of effort, and that's the kind of stuff I like. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. And I I was I was saying to you that basically every tour video I have of a shade garden has prostrata. Right. I mean, I can put I've, I've put this on the. I mean, it's, it seems like I can't even tour one, but you've got some experience with these actually in the full sun. I do. It, it's great in the shade. Uh, I wouldn't say absolute full full shade. It'll grow in full shade, but it'll right. be a more sparse yeah, like right. most evergreens in full shade that'll tolerate shade. It'll be more open, not near as dense. Here in the south. And I have them at my house. Uh, I, well, I don't have a fastigiata, but I have the others. Almost full sun. The first year or two that they're planted, you may get a little bit of yellowing on some of the, right. the new growth. 
And then it seems after about two or three years, they settle down and they'll be just this green, whether it's sun or not. And I have them lying in my driveway and then indica, old indica is on another side and they, they're all just tough as nails. Yeah, right. And we're talking unirrigated. We're talking beside right. dark asphalt. Right, and that's the thing about these being in the, in these prostratas being in the shade. I, where I see them is around oaks. I see, you know, I mean, they're, they're no irrigation. That, dr yeah. Very drought tolerant once, once established. So right. Just another workhorse plant that you can plant Forget about it. I've even had a, a nephew run over one with a four-wheeler, break all the foliage off. You know, a lot of people say conifers don't come back, junifers, pines, if you ever cut them down or totally lose all the foliage, you're done. Right. I've had this plant with no foliage left, a, a stub about like that uh -huh. remaining, regenerate from adventitious buds on that stub. Wow. So it's, it's a tough good. plant, one of my favorites. Nice. What we're looking at right now, now on my right, is some seven-gallon autumn rocket, Camellia sasanqua. This is a plant we started growing about five years ago. We really like it. It has a very upright nature, very uh, floriferous. Of course, it'll be bloomed out typically by Christmas uh, in our location here in North Carolina. But we, we're doing these in 15 gallons and seven gallons, and we, again, these sasanquas are useful as hedging plants. When they're not blooming, they're still beautiful with their shiny foliage and their growth habit. And I don't know if you can see the yuletide over here on the left. We do quite a few of them, too, in seven gallons. And uh, we're starting to do some of those in ten gallons, too. Just, again, I use the term workhorse a lot. I, I like plants that work in the landscape in and out of bloom, both. So you guys do some big golf tide osmanthus. Um, why do you like them? Well, we like it. Most people are familiar with the, uh, the fragrant osmanthus, uh, yeah. uh, osmanthus yeah. fragrance. Uh, yeah, and I covered it uh, 50 different ways okay, because good. it's in every, every yard you can go to. And we grow that and we sell a lot of it yeah. too. It, in fact, it sells out before this one, but again, this goes back to my workhorse plant. Good screening plant, can be used as a specimen, but right. this plant, because uh, it's blooming right now, it's not as floriferous as uh, fragrance, and we've pruned them for this. Right tight shape so we've cut off some of the wood that would be blooming. But this plant supposedly, uh, we sell a lot of them in the Long Island, New York for deer resistance. They've had deer problems up there that even eat some thuyas and some some ewes and things that we don't grow ewes much down here. We grow the plum ewes we've just been talking about. But this plant supposedly is the most deer resistant plant, at least on the east coast that I'm aware of it, as, as an ornamental upright evergreen. Right. So that's why we grow it. It's also fairly attractive, shiny, small, somewhat spiny foliage. Yeah, but it's really kind of, a, I mean, we call them false hollies because Correct. it looks like a, it looks like it would eat you alive, but you can, kind of, you can see us kind of grab a hold of it. It'll get you, I imagine you could figure out a way to hurt yourself. You can, if you're yeah, loading but, 200 on a truck to go uh, up, up uh, into New York or something, you'll right. uh, may get your finger pricked right. a little bit. But, okay, uh, just as a general, you know, for folks who don't have experience in a nursery trade, you're gonna take this as a rooted cutting, semi hardwood grows, maybe June, July one year. Okay, right? We can, we, we tend to root it in, in the right. fall, on okay. bottom heat, okay. in a fog house. But so from that rooted cutting, we're at a 25 gallon container today. Uh, how much, how long has that been? Uh, it's a minimum of four, but more than likely about five years. So five years as we're standing here in this nursery and in Fuqua, we're four to five years to go from a rooted cutting to this. So I don't, Absolutely. You know, yeah, we always get this at the, uh, you know, when I was selling plants at retail that I was growing in my nursery, somebody would come and buy 20 of something, and then the next week they'd come back for five more, and I was out, and they was like, when are you, when are you, gonna, when are you gonna get more? When are you gonna, it's like, I, I don't know that, I don't know that folks really, uh, that are outside of the nursery business understand. That's right, but it takes a variety. To be in business, you have to grow a lot of different plants. Not every plant can grow like a ligustrum recurvifolium, which you can have a sellable right. three gallon from a rooted cutting in basically 12 months. Right. There's a market, there's a place for those, and we grow those in tens and 15 gallons too, and three gallons, but we, we just look, this, the use for this plant would be, it's, a, it's an attractive plant, right. makes a good screen. If you don't want to see your neighbor, maybe, uh, right. eight to 10 feet, Right. Maybe go to 12 feet if you don't keep it pruned. And the deer resistance. And deer is a major problem here it in is, the Research Triangle just, area. Well, I'm, I'm in, I am in 
University Park by NC State, and you would think I don't have deer, and I have deer in the city, right in the middle of the city. Right. Yeah. So okay, awesome. This house has three gallon uh, poet's laurel in it. It's Dana Ray Samosa. It's just a beautiful name to pronounce in Latin to me, also. Again, this is just a, a, an evergreen plant that's uh, actually in, it's a, more of a lily. It's not a broadleaf plant. So it grows more like, it's more closely akin to asparagus if you want to think about something that you probably eat at home. The, uh, we've already picked most of the fruit off of these, but if we hadn't, most of these plants would probably have 10, 12, 15, 20 of these nice, brightly, bright red or orange fruit on them this time of year. Um, we harvest these so that we can produce some of our own crops. We buy some from another nursery too. But this plant is, uh, it does require shade. It's a tough plant. Put it in decently well-drained soil in, uh, I'd say, at least half shade. It'll, it'll handle heavier shade than half shade. Um, in our area, that would be like a northern exposure or northeast or eastern exposure in your landscape. Unless you're on a slope landscape and you have, you can create shade that you don't have on a flat landscape just by the aspect of the land. But anyway, it, one of the interesting things, it's used in the florist industry. I think the ancient Romans and all, when you talked about somebody uh, receiving their laurels, they would make a, uh, a head ornament out of the foliage of this exact plant right here. So somebody's uh, deserving of their laurels, they, they had done something really well. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we, when we do these from seed, we harvest the seed, like right now, when the seed are mature, we remove the covering, and these will be planted, hopefully, uh, maybe tomorrow even. But we remove the, the pulpy covering, we sow these in a community tray in rows. This was done a year ago, this was done on November the 18th of last year. And I found that, uh, oops, let me put those away. Uh, I get germination, probably 25, maybe 30% the first year. It'll send up one leaf. And that's what it'll do that whole year, the first year. Some of these seed may not germinate till next year. Uh, it can be a total of up to seven years or more to get to this stage. So a lot of our propagation we do from division. We'll grow some of these pots till they get heavy, multiple stems, multiple growing points. We'll divide them physically with a, with a knife or a sharp instrument and transplant some, but we do grow some from seed, and we grow from another source who grows some quartz from seed. But just to let you guys appreciate, some of these plants that are really nice plants in the landscape require a lot of specialized effort and a lot of time. This is another plant that I particularly like. It's a, a small growing evergreen. It's called sweet box. Uh, scientific name is Sarcococa confusa. I think it's still confused in the taxonomic trade, perhaps, but supposedly three to five feet of height, shade, very shade tolerant. In fact, it needs shade. But the fascinating thing about it, besides that it's well-contained, dark green, it's in the boxwood family, by the way. It blooms in February, March. You probably can't see it from there, but these little flower buds are subtending the leaves right now. They're not particularly showy, but it's a lot like Osmanthus fragrance. You, you can smell it from multiple feet away. So you'd plant this somewhere in your landscape where you, you're walking by and you just you sense it before you see it. You smell it in, in late winter. It's just a, a late winter interest and then the rest of the year it's green and filling some space. So frequently I frustrate you guys and take you to nurseries that you can't actually go to. This is actually one you can go to. It's open Monday through Friday. Uh, and uh, seasonally on, uh, on Saturdays as well. What they do here, it's a 50 acre nursery. They're not gonna let you drive around to every single plant, but they have pulled together examples of everything they have, which you can shop from. And then they've got guys that have picked more plants than you. And I guarantee you will pick better plants than you will. Cause I, you know, I, I know this from a lot of retail experience uh, and, they'll and they'll bring them to you. Really beautiful stuff. Um, I've told you when this video started, Sean is a an absolute wealth of uh, a wealth of knowledge, and uh, <laughs> and you can see you can see you can see that uh, across the, across the board. How many more years are you thinking the nursery business is uh, is for you? Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, I don't know. I don't ever intend to retire. I don't know if uh, yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Adcock will have me here for until I'm yeah, walking imagine. with a cane. But anyway, uh -huh. it's been fun. Uh, this nursery, as you can see in this display, we have multiple numbers in this display and in mm -hmm. a, a sun 
display. This is more of our shade display. Right. So to avoid having to go out and pick from the bed, you can pretty much pick a, an order here. Right. And it, again, it displays the diversity we do. Everything from four inch ground cover, such as Green Sheen Pachysandra, mm -hmm. to Zelkova in 25 gallons. Right, and, yeah, gotcha. Uh, ferns, things that a lot of other people don't grow, like uh, Ruscus, mm -hmm. which we didn't even talk about that on the details. Yeah. Uh, Rodea, other shade tolerant perennials. But anyway, there's a lot here and we're, we're glad to be able to serve you. Nice, nice. Well, thank you very much, Sean. You've been a great host. Um, I'm gonna get back over here uh, seasonally and show you some additional things and some individual plants that I wanna cover. Um, so thanks thank, a lot. Thank Sean. you, Jim, appreciate you coming. Yep, thanks for watching, guys.